surveys have often shown that the single biggest fear of americans is public speaking my single biggest fear has always been that someday i will be introduced by larry brilliant <laughs> a third of a century ago many of us went to india to work on smallpox eradication some went to seek adventure but not larry he went in search of truth and he continues that journey searching for truth today sometimes he interrupts the journey to babble nonsense <laughs> as you just heard but but even that can be fun and, and thank you larry Last week, I was on a panel in Washington, D.C., and had the chance to talk about how life surprises us. I had gotten on an airplane in Seattle, sat down in the aisle seat, was reading a newspaper. A man excused himself and took the seat next to me. We talked for just a moment. I made a mental note of the fact that he was probably in his 80s, that he had a white beard, and the thing that struck me, he was very unattractive, even for an older man. I went back to reading my newspaper, and five minutes later, a woman standing in the aisle, waiting for people to disappear in front of her, tapped me on the shoulder, and she asked, are you two twins? A year ago, <laughs> our seven-year-old grandson was sitting in the back of the car, and the two of us alone, and I was thinking about how this is an old Greek story, because we see ourselves as going into the future. The ancient Greeks saw themselves as backing into the future because they couldn't see it. And I was thinking, my future is literally and figuratively behind me, and I only get glimpses by listening to the sound of his voice, and suddenly he asked, and I'm not making this up, he asked me, what's the most important thing people could do to make the world better? In some sense, this conference is an attempt to answer the question of a seven-year-old boy. I'm going to suggest five ingredients for a partial answer to that question as it pertains to financing global health. Now, it would not be unreasonable to tally the possible sources for monetary funds, in-kind assistance, skills, knowledge, tools, which would be needed to solve the major global health problems. But I'm going to avoid that because there is a more generic question. The problem, of course, is enormous. And if I tell you that, that 200,000 children under the age of five will die this week in the world, it's just a statistic. Until you think that that's about what we lost with the tsunami some years ago. And you will recall this was so important to our country that we sent two ex-presidents and all kinds of aid. And then you think that's happening every week with children under the age of five. This week, next week, every week this year. And look at our response. It's simply not important enough for us to try to change it. But there are some touchstones to keep in mind as we think about an appropriate response. On the one hand, I can tell you I am so delighted by what has happened in recent years with rich people stepping up and saying they want to change the world. In global health, we were always the bottom of the barrel and we even started thinking like poor people that we don't deserve more resources. It never would have crossed my mind that a rich person would become interested in global health. And if it had crossed my mind, I never would have thought it'll be the richest couple in the world. If that had ever crossed my mind, I never would have thought maybe they'll convince the second richest person. And so you see how great it is, but then think of the other side of this. Even if the Gates Foundation puts $3 billion a year into global health, even if they do that, 
That's what we spend on health in this country every 12 hours. And look at the inequities in this country. So it's not that much money. So number one of my five points, no matter what we do, governments and the marketplace will always be the biggest players. And therefore, long-term solutions are dependent on inspiring government and marketplace involvement. You're all well-versed in the marketplace. But allow me to suggest that when, when it comes to government, there is a reason why it should be the biggest player. For whatever our criticisms of government, and we have ample reason to criticize, it is the only organization in a country that represents everyone. No foundation, no service organization, no religious group, no corporation represents all of us. Government does and should. Number two, we've heard this in many ways in the last three days, we are all in this together. And that's the key, the actual belief that we are all in this together. This is the concept that dominated the thinking in America during the Second World War, the motto of the greatest generation. And that means everyone. Will Durant commenting on what happened in this country during the Second World War raised the question, what would it take to get the world to respond? And he said, the world will respond in that fashion only if it fears an alien invasion. We have now seen that there are some things so powerful that they become surrogates for an alien invasion. Nuclear weapons, for sure, but in some sense, that is what allowed smallpox eradication, why we were, are working on polio eradication, and why we are now suddenly becoming so interested in climate change. These are surrogates for an alien invasion. Issues that force us to see that we're all in this together. And if we are to change global health, we must see this as a common effort. If that actually happens, then decisions on the role of government, corporations, foundations, and so forth become secondary. So it's changing the social norm that precedes funding. We must make this great divide untenable and wrong, incompatible with our sense of civilization. Many have said this in the, in the past. Our own Surgeon General 50 years ago, Leonard Sheely, said the world cannot continue to exist half sick and half healthy. Schweitzer said it. Gandhi said, my idea of the golden rule is I should not be able to enjoy what the masses cannot. So our first job is to make this a common belief, the social norm. Number three, and again, we've heard this in various ways over the last three days, coalitions. The world is so complex that nothing can be done by a single person or a single organization. It's not a new thought. Polybius, 2,000 years ago, said things in the past may have happened in isolation. But he said, from this time forth, the world must be seen as an organic whole. 2,000 years ago, and he gave examples of things happening in Africa that were now impacting Athens. Everything affects everything. To do anything, therefore, requires a coalition, and leadership in anything, including global health, is no longer found in a title, whether that be director of WHO or president of the United States or billionaire. Leadership is found in the person who can assemble an effective coalition. What are the emerging rules of successful coalitions? First and foremost is a clear vision of the last mile that will result from the coalition. People will not invest their time just because it's nice to improve the health of someone else. There must be, in the words of Gary Wills, a certain trumpet. And he takes that title of his book on leadership from a Bible verse that says, if you hear an uncertain trumpet, who would gird for battle? So in global health, we must be as certain as were the abolitionists. 
when they said the system of slavery was wrong and that it was possible to abolish it. We need to be just as certain that the current system is wrong, to not use the tools and skills and knowledge of science and medicine for all is a declaration of slavery for some. We are willing to condemn others to an enslavement that we would not impose on our own families. We have to be so clear of what that last mile looks like and that it can be achieved. Norman Cousins, in an editorial for the Bicentennial, asked the question, what's the greatest gift the US has given the world in 200 years? And his answer was the greatest gift is the understanding that it is possible, it is possible to plan a rational future. And we have to sell that idea that it's possible to have a rational future in global health. That the vision of our forefathers 230 years ago for a new country can be matched now with a vision for a new world. And only then, after we have an absolutely clear last mile of global health equity, is it possible to define the first mile of the journey, to figure out the resources needed and how we will get there. Gene Case said yesterday that the same old way isn't going to get us there. Number four, re-ask the question continuously and in various ways. What do we hope to achieve? What should the last mile look like? And then play with different answers. Richard Feynman, the great physicist, was looking in the mirror one morning and suddenly it struck him that the explanation physicists had always given for why left and right are reversed in the mirror could not possibly be true, or top and bottom would be reversed also. Now, I suspect physicists are more egotistical than most of us, so they probably look in mirrors more often, and yet every physicist that had ever looked in the mirror had not thought of that, and it caused him to look again at what happens when you look in the mirror. Our oldest son, David, said to me one day when he was very young, I wish I could see you for the first time. And I asked him, what do you mean? He said, well, my friends tell me you're so tall and I don't notice that, but I wish I could see you for the first time. And that's what we have to keep doing. Look at global health for the first time and see if it changes the question. We had hints of this on Wednesday with the example, what would happen if we could put a price on carbon? Another example, though, is look at health care in the United States. We've gotten ourselves in a terrible situation, and yet we've been stuck for decades asking the same question. How do we balance quality, cost, and access? And it keeps getting us to the same answer. Simply changing the question from how do we balance quality, cost, and access to how do we balance quality, cost, and outcome suddenly changes everything because it means we have to measure health outcomes. If we can't measure them, we're in a strange business. And if we can measure them, we could now have the marketplace pay for health outcomes. And what would happen? Suddenly insurance providers would be trying to enroll sick people rather than well people because that's the way they would make their money is by improving health outcomes and suddenly you would have to have prevention in the medical care system. Or look at the example of eradication. For years, we used to ask the question, which diseases could be eradicated? And we would go through them. And then 15 years ago, we simply changed the question at the Carter Center. And we didn't ask which diseases could be eradicated. We asked the question, what are the barriers to eradication of this disease? And we went through hundreds of diseases, and what did we end up with? A research agenda for every disease. So what are the critical barriers? In global health, we need to ask, what are the critical barriers to health equity? How do we incorporate everyone, and especially government? How do we use the marketplace to the maximum? How do we detect when the marketplace is not working, as, for instance, with tobacco, and correct it? How do we provide the global leadership that says we're all in this together, and for the long term. Back to Will Durant and the concept of an alien invasion. 
We need to make AIDS and avian flu and polio and infant deaths and maternal mortality surrogates for an alien invasion. We have to develop better incentives for the business community. I think what corporate corporations have been doing in global health recently is one of the great chapters in global health. Merck and Mectazan giving hundreds of millions of treatments free. Glaxo giving albendazole for lymphatic filariasis. And we heard yesterday from Steve Case that we have to have people who are proud of working for their companies because of what the company does. Let me give you one quick example. With guinea worm in West Africa, it requires filtering water to take out the water flea. A division of DuPont at that time called Precision Fabrics came up with a brand new synthetic material that would do this and would not fall apart after repeated washings. They donated the first million square yards of this for guinea worm. And then they became so proud of what they were doing, they continued donating it. They only make this cloth one day out of every few months. On that day, absenteeism goes down. People feel proud to work for a corporation that does these things. There are ways that we can come up with improving what they do. Number five, understand the generic forces behind poor health. And the biggest one, of course, is poverty. Many of us in this room regard ourselves as rich, but we make no protest over the fact that the poor are subsidizing us. Food is cheaper, our rooms are less costly at the Sheraton because people are working at minimum wage. The same thing is true for poor countries. Part of my wealth is accumulated on the backs of sick women in Africa. And I should be troubled by that. Part of my wealth is subsidized by the future. I will never repay my carbon debt. Someone in the future will have to do that. I will never even repay my part of the national debt. My grandchildren will be doing that. William Wilberforce did not end slavery 200 years ago when he finally succeeded in getting parliament to stop the slave trade but he ended the idea that it was okay to have slavery. The slavery of those living today and in the future, slavery imposed by poor health, global climate change and poverty is condoned by many as necessary for business. They aren't willing to protect the environment because it would be bad for US economic growth. We are the slave masters and must be willing to say that with force and clarity. We have the job that Wilberforce had two centuries ago to change the social norm, say it is wrong, it is evil to enslave the future to satisfy our economic appetite. In the parlance of the day, it's not a few bad apples, it's a bad barrel we live in. People in this room don't need to be convinced, but you do need to be convinced that you have to play a role in getting the rest of society to think this way. It's not just that we need wise leaders in our country. We need every voice in this room saying this is what is needed for global health. So in closing, I come back to the single major message in how to finance global health. If we're to change global health equity, we must change the social norm to a common understanding that inequity in health is a form of slavery. And in the words of Primo Levi, when you know how to relieve torment and don't, then you become the tormentor. When we believe that, the funding will be easy. And we can answer a seven-year-old who asks, what is the most important thing people could do to improve the world? Thank you. The last mile is clear, namely global health equity. Then it's important to start concentrating on what does the first mile look like, how to describe it, describe strategies, theories of change, how we pay for it. We have an exceptional panel here, and we're mixing private and public funding. So we'll have one person who represents private funding, 
two people that represent public funding one person that represents the mix of public and private all of them have great experience many of them on the ground all of them have passion and every one of them fits the description of harlan cleveland who when he talked about global health workers said they have unwarranted optimism we're going to start with lisa lisa kimbo has a background in economics and public health and she has done a very very clever mixture of franchising microcredit healthcare good management to show what can be delivered in health in africa with the private sector i've actually visited her work and i tell you it's so impressive you come back saying that this has to be replicated so lisa inspire us <laughs> you know dr bill feggy says lisa inspire us after he has you know done this job i, I don't know why he's setting me up this way <laughs> Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to be introduced to you by Dr. Phil, Bill Feige, who did come out and visit uh, child and family wellness shops in Kenya several years ago, um, finding us really, you know, sort of in the trenches there trying to figure out how to do this work. And, and he gave us such, you know, motivation um, mm -hmm. and encouragement that we were on the right path. Um, and I'll briefly tell you about what CFW Shops Kenya uh, is doing through sustainable healthcare. Um, take a walk with me, if you will, to rural Kenya for a moment, where actually 80% of our population lives. Um, you'll need to go down some, you know, bad roads. Uh, you'll find beautiful countryside, and you will meet women, you know, mothers with children going about their daily you know, activities, and they're earning a living, they're earning an income, they wake up every day, and it could be picking tea, it could be other farm work, but they're earning a dollar or two in a day. Well, when a mother wakes up and her child is sick, then she has to make these choices. Does she go about her activities to earn that income that she needs for that day, or does she take the child and walk a half an hour to one hour to a public health facility, hoping that you know by early afternoon she might actually have been seen because the line is so long, hoping that there will be drugs available on that day you know, at the facility, and that she will not have to go out and maybe you know, go to the shops to find some painkiller that might you know, help the child for this moment and not knowing what that drug will be, whether it will be a drug, whether it will be powder, this is what mothers go through all the time in not only rural Kenya, but in a lot of parts of the world. Well, if this mother happens to wake up and she's in a village that is served by a CFW outlet, she has an alternative because there she can go into an outlet where she'll find a nurse, somebody who is qualified and who she knows, who will speak to her in her language. She will most probably not find any long lines. She can go there early in the morning and have the child attended to. She can get a good quality drug. She can get advice on how she can prevent this disease, if it is a preventable disease, as many of them are. And she can go about her daily work, and she will earn her funds for that day, and it will have cost her, on average, about a half of what she earns. In other words, if she's earning about a dollar, our average transaction cost is just 50 cents. This is what our vision is for every single village that we have out there, is that Kenya has the opportunity because Kenya has the nurses. We have over 30,000 trained nurses and the government is able to employ less than half of those. The private sector um, is employing maybe another 5,000. So Kenya is in a unique situation where we actually have nurses who are unemployed. We would love for them to get a business opportunity to run a CFW clinic that enables them to avoid the temptations of coming out and solving the problems of you know, lack of health workers in the US and in the UK. And this is an opportunity that makes sense uh, for the nurses.
They work within a franchise that ensures, first of all, that they are qualified, that provides them with initial training in business and how to run their franchise ac um, activity in a profitable way, that controls the prices um, of the products so that the people can afford them. And where we, as a franchise organization, do central procurement so that we're sure that only drugs and products of the right quality are getting to the people. And the outlets are profitable. The nurses, on average, are making um, good income. I'll give you an example of one of our nurses, Evangeline, um, who recently opened, she opened an outlet just last year. And Evangeline, in the area in which she is, in a community of about 10,000 people, um, sees, on average, um, 800 to 1,000 clients in a month. And from the earnings that she is making within a community that is on average, again, earning one to two dollars or three hundred and fifty dollars in a day, she has a turnover of over five thousand dollars in a year and she is taking home about three thousand five hundred dollars, which is about ten times, you know, what her market is able, you know, is, is making. So she's earning a good living. She's in a community that, you know, where she comes from and she is comfortable. And so this is this is our vision. And just very briefly, that is what we are doing in terms of providing an alternative to the public sector delivery. So I'll end there for now. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Lisa. We will uh, have questions after all four speakers have had a chance to say something. Our next speaker will be Richard Feacham. Now, many of you think of him as the director of the Global Fund. Some of you that are older will remember that he was also the dean of the London School of Tropical Medicine. Mm -hmm. And some of you who are my age will remember that he actually started in a field in the Solomon Islands, in the highlands of New Guinea. So he's had the entire spectrum of uh, global health work. Mm. Richard? Well, thank you very much, Bill, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to be here. Um, and I've been pondering the dilemma of what I can say that will add value to the very rich discussions that we've already had and that other, uh, the comments that other speakers um, have made. And, and I want to pose two questions in relation to global health. And before I do that, let me say that it is clearly the case that both the challenges in global health and the opportunities, the energy, the excitement, the innovation in global health have never been greater. And I think that's what gives much excitement to these discussions here. The two questions I'd like to pose are, firstly, in relation to global health, do we know what to do? And then the second question is, do we know how to do it? I'll speak very briefly on the first question, but at greater length on the second one. The first question, do we know what to do? My answer would be more or less, and certainly sufficiently, that we can get moving on a much greater scale with confidence that we have at least some of the solutions. If I apply that question, do we know what to do to the three diseases which the Global Fund focuses on, AIDS, TB, and malaria, the answer is clearly more or less, um, a little less for AIDS, um, and much, much more for malaria. We know exactly what to do for malaria, it's just we're not yet doing it. But we sufficiently know what to do, and we're sufficiently beginning to do those things, and we do have confidence in the technical solutions that are already to hand. And I think that's a very important starting point. Let me come then to my second question and spend a little more time on that. Uh, do we know how to do it? And my answer to that question is increasingly, and we are learning a lot right now. And I think this conference and things we've heard in Palo Alto are very much part of this learning process, which has really taken off and accelerated in the last very few years about how to do it and how to do it better than we've done it in the past few decades. And I've been jotting down, as, as indeed um, Bill has been, obviously, um, in his list of uh, kind of lessons learned, uh, I've been jotting down my list of lessons learned, and I came up with six, which I'll quickly share with you, which overlap with Bill's, but are not, are not identical. My first lesson learned, and all these lessons learned come from five years of global fund experience, but also from 
the discussions we've been having here and what we've all been learning in the business of trying to have a larger and more rapid impact on global health. My first lesson learned is the extreme importance, the extreme importance of local ownership, which I see as the same as letting the demand side rule. Let people on the front line, people like Lisa and others we've heard from, tell us what they most need. Let them come up with the solutions and let us back their ideas, their priorities, and their sense of what needs to be done tomorrow. And never think that we can sit in Geneva or Washington or London and second guess the people on the front line because we will get it wrong. And historically, we have repeatedly got it wrong when we've tried this second guessing. So let the demand side rule, trust the demand side, as the Global Fund has done, and you'll be surprised with a good outcome. If Adam Smith had chosen to write a chapter on development finance models in his book, Wealth of Nations, he would have proposed something exactly like the Global Fund, and he would have been exactly right. The demand side actually works in the allocation of finance for global health. Trust it and let it drive the investments. The second lesson is performance-based funding really, really matters. The money must follow the results, not the good intentions, not even the need or the demand, but the results. We all know that this business needs passion, compassion, it needs soft-heartedness, but it also needs a lot of hard-nosedness and hard-headedness. And money following results is a way to reward those who are doing the right thing with commitment and energy and to funnel resources to support their work and not to get locked into long-term funding of programs that are in fact not producing the results which benefit the people which everybody wants to see. So money follow results, not easy to say, not easy to do, I have to say, but really worth pushing the envelope um, in performance-based financing models. Thirdly, transparency. When I came to the Global Fund, the Global Fund, as most of you know, is, is five years old, and um, I've just handed over to my successor, having um, been guiding it for its first five years. And when we started, I didn't realize the power of transparency. I didn't realize how important it is that you can track on our website 450 investment streams in 136 countries. You can follow them result by result, scorecard by scorecard, disbursement by disbursement. And I thought that that was kind of obviously the right thing to do. But what has emerged is that most organizations in the field of development finance actually don't do that. You cannot track on their website disbursement by disbursement, result by result, decision by decision, what the money is buying and why the disbursement decision was actually taken. And I think that's regrettable. And I think we all need to be very, very transparent. Steve Case made an interesting point yesterday. He said when they started, he was a bit embarrassed to have a website because he thought people might think he was showing off. But then he realized that he had a duty to have a website and a duty to inform. And I think that's absolutely right. People have a right to know. People have a right to follow, to be engaged, and to follow the dollar by dollar and the result by result. And I would encourage all of us. Um, I, I'm very disappointed that the Global Fund's website is, I believe, in the transparency arena, the best in the business. It shouldn't be the best in the business. Other people should be ahead of the Global Fund, and it should be possible to track other people's money in even greater detail than you can for the Global Fund. And that kind of transparency um, also supports the learning while doing that is so important because it enables, enables everyone to learn from everyone else's ex experience because the data is in the public domain. And it's also, in our experience, a huge break on corruption. If you can follow every disbursement and every result that is claimed to have been achieved, and if you don't think it's true, you can put up a flag, you can blow a whistle, you can raise a question. Because what people claim is going on is in the public domain, and if you think there's any distortion in that, then you absolutely have the space to say so. And I think uh, that form of extreme transparency uh, is, is uh, a great asset in the ongoing uh, um, 
ongoing effort to ensure the money is used for the intended purposes and not diverted for other purposes. My fourth heading, which we've heard a lot about at this conference, is innovation. We really need to innovate, and people in this room are innovating, and I've been incredibly excited by the things that I've heard here in Palo Alto. Lisa is a great innovator. These are really exciting models and new ideas. And we need to innovate because the models of the last few years, of the last few decades, haven't done the job very well, frankly. And if we, if we do what we did, we get what we got. And remember what we got. We got an HIV pandemic, which just grew inexorably for its first 25 years, while we stood and watched and didn't do much that was very effective to prevent it. We've, we've, what we've got in the past is two decades of malaria steadily worsening for no good technical reason. So the models that we used in the past were not um, particularly effective. There are some spectacular exceptions to that, like smallpox eradication. But a lot that we did didn't actually do the job patently. And we do need to innovate. We do need to try new models. And people in this room are doing that. And I, I, I applaud that. Fifthly, and, and I will sort of add to what Bill said on this subject here, we need to support private sector solutions. Of course it's true that governments have a role, particularly a role of stewardship, a role of protecting the interests of the very vulnerable, a role of ensuring that there is not an exploitation of patients by medical providers. But the line probably stops about there. And when we look at the big task of financing healthcare and providing healthcare in the developing countries, we need to emphasize the role of NGOs, the role of churches, and the role of major private organizations, both for-profit and not-for-profit. Because we've come out of a period in which we have called on governments to do things they are simply not capable of doing. And we have had expectations in government and in government's capacity that are utterly unrealistic. And we need to unleash the energy of private individuals, NGOs, churches, and major private organizations, as I say, both for-profit and not-for-profit, in the business of delivering healthcare. And we're just beginning to do this, but it's a very early start. And it's very interesting how people who, um, because of their background in Silicon Valley or whatever it is, have a complete belief in, in the market and in the role of the private sector, when they come into the health domain, they suddenly become very socialist and very statist in their thinking and assume things about governments, which they would never assume in California or in Sweden or in France. But in Malawi, suddenly the government should do this and the government should be responsible for, for that thing or this thing. And those expectations are very unrealistic. And I think we need to have a paradigm shift towards emphasizing private energy, private solutions, private innovation, both in the finance, but particularly in the delivery of healthcare. And then lastly, and I think it's obvious from what's gone before and from what many others have said, we need to, take, we need to be bold, we need to take risks. It goes with the innovation. <coughs> we need to see failures as a learning experience, as an opportunity to get up and do it better next time. And again, that atmosphere is really alive in this room and in this gathering. And I think that's been very, very heartening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we now turn to Peter Piot, and many of you will think of him as the director of UNAIDS. He had a career before UNAIDS, and he worked in Africa, and he was one of the key people, not only to figure out what was happening with AIDS, but also uh, one of the key people in figuring out what was happening with Ebola virus. So he has uh, a broad range. He's been an educator. And uh, Peter, inform us. Thank you, Bill. And good morning, everybody. And uh, I must say I owe a lot to you. I remember after the Ebola virus uh, epidemic, the first one that in 76, um, I ended up in uh, CDC, where you were the director and in these days uh, there were not that many foreigners, I think, coming to CDC or uh, in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And you, as a director, you wanted to meet with each of us. And that in itself, for me, tells the whole story of you, your interest as the director of a huge uh, machine 
which I found unbearably bureaucratic, and now the irony is I'm working in the UN, but anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, that you had this uh, attention for us young people coming from, from the field. So thank you for that. Now, in 2000, after I had called at a international conference on AIDS in Durban, in South Africa, I'd called that for moving from the M word to the B word when it comes to funding for AIDS, from millions to billions. Shortly after that, I got a letter um, on behalf of basically all government donors, um, including from this country, um, saying that um, I shouldn't make this kind of statements that uh, the money in any case isn't there and that um, I shouldn't count on it, on a, on a major increase uh, for funding for AIDS. And seven years later, um, where are we? We, in these days, um, when UNAIDS was founded 10 years ago, about $250 million was spent on AIDS in developing countries, on fighting AIDS. Um, this year, we probably will be around $10 billion. So an unprecedented um, increase. And also so far for uh, the attitude of the donors in these days, um, I mean government donors, who were part of the denial syndrome, and it illustrates how far we've come uh, in terms of attention for global health, uh, just taking uh, the AIDS epidemic as an indicator. And I'd like to um, address briefly five uh, questions. The first thing is, what happened? Why has there been that increase in terms of attention for AIDS and in terms of the funding and giving us an unprecedented momentum that we are um, in to today? And I think the basic uh, um, driver has been politics. And in public health, people don't like to hear that. But it's really the fact that um, heads of state, prime ministers, um, stood up and took charge of the issue. That um, we had a um, President Obasanjo from Nigeria in 2001 hosting a uh, special summit of what was then called the Organization of African Unity um, with over 40 presidents. And they all said, yes, we care about AIDS, we should do something about it as continent. Um, when the um, United Nations, the leadership of Kofi Annan, who really um, was the first Secretary General to take on um, global health, AIDS, as um, a major issue for international politics. When in 2001, there was a special session of the UN General Assembly, 40 heads of state came there, they went home and they said, I'm gonna take personally charge of this issue. My Minister of Health is important, but this is something that should engage the whole nation. And as The Economist wrote, uh, I think last year, it doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to see that that special session of the UN really represented a sea change in how AIDS was considered, not anymore as a one of many uh, public health problems, but one of the make or break issues of our time in the same league as climate change, massive poverty, and so on. Um, it was also Bill Gates, his engagement. Um, it was when President Bush put $15 billion on the table in the State of the Union address in 2003 which also completely changed the, um, the landscape in terms of funding. And it was activism, grassroots activism, um, that we're seeing in developing countries and where we now have a true uh, global movement, transnational global civil society movement, um, with the, the prime uh, um, activist movement being in South Africa, the Treatment Action Campaign. And lastly, I would say, um, at some point when antiretroviral therapy became available, um, leaders got the feeling that this be has become a problem with the solution. And we always have to stress not only the doom and gloom of uh, global health uh, problems and, and AIDS and so on, but also that there are solutions. Otherwise, why would you want to invest in it? And uh, even if antiretroviral therapy is not the solution of this epidemic, it gave this kind of feeling, yes, we can do something about it. So what we had is, as uh, somebody said yesterday, I can't remember who it was, in terms of the innovation in terms of the funding was not driven by, by science or by 
um, technical innovation technology, but really by a political movement. Second question is that um, where uh, is the money coming from today? We're about halfway of, in terms of the needs. And the money is coming, uh, but two, th well, 80% is coming from governments. It really illustrates Bill's points. There is no replacement for government, um, for government responsibilities in various forms. And we can discuss what exactly that these forms are, but uh, about 80% is coming from governments. Of the $10 billion, um, about 85%, 80% uh, is coming from donors from the north, um, and 85% um, of that money is from the US and from other um, G8 uh, countries. Just under one third of the money is now coming and increasingly from the governments of the developing countries themselves. And um, who can do more? First of all, uh, when you look at the uh, spending by governments in the world in terms of official development aid, there is an international agreement to spend 0.7% of gross domestic product um, income, actually, uh, to uh, official development assistance. Only the northern countries in Europe are following that. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland is getting close. None of the big economies in the world are doing this. And some are the worst offenders of this international agreement that they repeated also at Glen Eagles, at G8 summits and so on. There is some improvement, but let's not forget that last year there was actually a decline for the first time in about 10 years of official development assistance. So the richest countries in the world can do more. Secondly, um, and I think here we are in a, in a, cri a critical phase in the US because the uh, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which has done a, a great job, um, not perfect, but a great job, and it's due for reauthorization. This will be a test of the willingness in Congress um, what to spend in long term on a global health issue. Secondly, we have emerging countries. China is emerging as a major donor, but totally outside any of the classic frameworks for international development, particularly in Africa. Um, China, Brazil, Russia, India, um, all can become donors today, um, and we should work with these countries in a very different way than we used to work. I'm going to China in, in July, um, for example, and uh, the purpose of my trip is not so much to discuss how can we as UNAIDS work with China in China, which we are doing, and which is still necessary, but how are we going to work together in other Asian countries, in Africa, and uh, join forces? Um, and China and Russia have become donors, modest donors, to the Global Fund, for example, but they could do much, much more. Thirdly, um, we have creative new initiatives. Um, France and Brazil have been pushing for um, an airline tax, which they don't want to call an airline tax, but it's an airline tax. Uh, and the money of that, it's, it's going in a fund, which will again benefit uh, in a pretty sustainable way, um, potentially about $300 million per year, uh, global health issues and with the global fund. We've got in the immunization field, we'll hear it from Alice, the international financing facility and so on, and we've got the RED campaign. Bobby Schreider and, and Richard and Bono have really pioneered another uh, very innovative um, way of uh, sustainable financing. And then I would say, um, never think that as a foundation, as a donor, you're too small to contribute. Um, and I'll come back to that later. But if we, there's a really a ground swell of small funders that can make a difference if we partner up with each other, if we invest strategically. There are niches in so many ways um, and great opportunities. Third question is, um, can the money be spent? It's the how question of uh, Richard. And here I would say that uh, we should devote at least as much attention to how the money can be spent and making the money work as the, the mantra is in, in UNAIDS, um, as in raising the money. 
And uh, five points here. What are the issues? And many of them will be familiar to you. One is management and capacity. Um, this is what business can bring. It's what we just heard from Lisa also. And it's also, um, we're in a very dramatic situation because for decades, governments of developing countries and international donors have actually undermined in a major way the public sector and public health. Not only by not investing, but by undermining the capacity of the uh, healthcare workers and the systems. Secondly, I couldn't agree more with Richard, and that is the ownership. Without the ownership, the local ownership, we can have the best plan, the billions of dollars, it won't work. And so we've got to invest in that. It may be slower. And uh, with our mentality of the quarterly report, we may be frustrated. But sometimes, as this uh, Latin uh, proverb says, festina lente, hurry up slowly, is the best approach. Invest in the local ownership. Thirdly, coordination saves lives. I wasn't born with an interest in coordination. And, um, but I can tell you what I've seen in my job is that what damage it can do when everybody comes in with their little projects running into different directions, not respecting local ownership, and um, actually wasting a lot of money. Fourth is that we need to be, do a better job in bringing the unit cost down. Most obvious one has been the reduction in price of antiretrovirals in, in the case of AIDS, um, a result of negotiations that we did in the UNAIDS many years ago, shaving up the last penny, by the Black Clinton Foundation been doing, and IRA is here, uh, and also competition from generic manufacturers. But also we can uh, bring the unit cost down for actually the delivery of um, the programs. And uh, that is in itself a, where we need the business community, I think, much, much more. So there are huge investments for uh, opportunities for investments to make the money work, not only to provide the big money, but just small investments are needed to oil the machine and to make sure that the goods are delivered. Fourth question, what should we have done differently? What are the failures? We were asked here by Jane to, uh, to also reflect on that. Um, five points here. First, as Richard also said, we waited for too, far too long. If we would have had the investments for AIDS today, uh, at that we have today, if we would have them deployed 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we wouldn't have had 65 million people living with HIV, 25 million deaths, and, and entire economies devastated. We could have made a difference um, at the time when, um, you know, the uh, prevention would have really saved so many lives. And the longer we've waited, the more expensive the bill is becoming. So the, the cost of inaction is phenomenal, and that's true for many, many other uh, issues. That's a, that should be a, a major lesson. Secondly, we've neglected ownership and the demand side. Thirdly, we've not invested in the beginning in, um, in better coordination and coherence. Fourth, we focused entirely, and including people like me, on raising the money and not enough on delivering the goods. And lastly, and that will be my last point, is that we've lacked a long-term view. And of course, when you deal with AIDS, 8,000 people dying every day, uh, it is a crisis. But we haven't thought through, that's my last point, about what are the implications of our actions today, the long-term implications. And let's not fool ourselves. AIDS is not gonna disappear one fine day. Um, it'll be with us for generations. Um, it will require a very sustained effort. And yesterday, Steve Case said that, you know, we are thinking in our, in our thinking is too short term. We need to find the right balance also when it comes to AIDS between dealing with the crisis today, so crisis management, but also the long term. Just take more than two million people in the developing world who are antiretroviral therapy. Who is going to pay for that 10, 20, 30 years from now? Where will that money come from? In China, we hope it will be possible. But in a country like, I don't know, Malawi and Zambia and so on, they will depend for a long time on foreign aid. Can a country still be called sovereign when hundreds of thousands of its citizens are depending for their daily survival from foreign 
from a foreign donor? Um, what will be the sustainability of um, you know, the political commitment, programmatic sustainability, and so on? These are a, a number of questions that we're asking our new needs in a project that we call 2031. AIDS 2031. Why 2031? It's 50 years after the first description of AIDS in, in 1981. And looking at the longer term implications of our actions and what we can do differently now that will affect what and how 2031 will look like for, for AIDS. So it's not a debate what we should do in 2031, but what we should do today to have the best uh, outcome. And that's going to be a really uh, major challenge for all of us, combining the crisis management and the long-term uh, investment. So in conclusion, I would say that AIDS has demonstrated that one, a global mobilization around the health issue is absolutely possible, with strong ownership across the, uh, the, the globe. Secondly, that we've demonstrated that this is a problem with a solution. But also that there are no quick fixes, and again, that we need to partner up against AIDS and have far more this long-term view. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Our last speaker will be Alice Albright, who represents the new future of global health, bringing a career of finance and banking and the marketplace to the problems of financing vaccines, the single best tool in global health. So Alice, tell us about the possibilities of public and private coalitions. Thank you very much, Bill. And I'd like to just uh, say at the beginning that everybody at Gavi uh, very much thanks you as well as the Gates Foundation for being uh, huge sources of inspiration to us and uh, very much our intellectual drivers. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity this morning to tell you all a little bit about the status of childhood immunization in the third world, which we define as the 70th poorest countries in the world. Uh, tell you a bit about Gavi and in particular focus on two uh, two innovations that we've put in place recently uh, that we think we're very proud of and I think demonstrate uh, how we can begin to use market forces to begin to address some of these issues. Uh, sadly, and, and you all will have gotten a sense of this during this conference and otherwise, there is a huge glaring gap uh, between the availability of immunization services in the, in the developed world here in Europe, in Japan, uh, and in the third world. Um, every year, 10 million children die before they reach their fifth birthday. So 10 million children. Of these, about two and a half million die from diseases that are preventable by vaccines that exist right now. Uh, and so and it's not just vaccines that were invented just recently. These are vaccines that have been out there for 20 years, for example. So that is just a huge, huge gap. Um, it's widely recognized by many in the public health world that immunization, as Bill has just said, is probably one of the most cost-effective public health interventions. Uh, it's very low cost and it's very high payoff. So there's a real, uh, there's a real rationale to it. Uh, for the, the vaccines that Gavi's engaged in, we estimate that it costs about $30 to immunize each child fully for the diseases that we're involved in. Uh, so that's hardly any money at all compared to what you spend on a cup of coffee at Starbucks or what have you, uh, but it's tremendously powerful. Um, and I wanted to now talk a little bit about why there is this gap, and there's really a few reasons for it. One uh, is a, a, a lack of consistent multi-year committed money. Uh, we've done some estimation work through some of our partners, WHO being uh, the principal one, and they're a very important partner of our organization. Uh, and we've estimated that uh, it will cost about $35 billion to fully immunize every child for all the diseases for which vaccines are available at the moment. So that's a huge number, uh, but not a number that is consistently available. So one of the biggest problems is that there's a huge funding gap. Uh, the second problem is that there is a consistent underinvestment in both research and development as well as plant capacity for vaccines. Vaccines are a pretty difficult business, and I know that there are some vaccine manufacturers out here in the audience, and I'm sure that they will confirm that. It's a pretty tough business. Uh, not super profitable, very regulated, very risky, et cetera. Uh, and there is a problem in the R&D world that we call the 90-10 problem. I hope the numbers aren't right. I hope it's more like 80-20, but I'll call it the 90-10 problem. About 90% of the R&D money that's available in the world goes to fixing about 10% of the problems. And 90% of the disease burden 
is not being where that R&D money is being targeted. So there's a pretty big dislocation between where the R&D money is going and where the problems exist. Um, all of this combines to create a situation where, uh, at the moment, it's taking, depending on what disease you're talking about and what vaccine you're talking about, 10, 15, in some cases, 20 years to actually get the vaccine to be available. So that is just obviously too long. Let me tell you now a little bit about Gavi. Gavi is a public-private partnership. We were created and launched in the year 2000, so we're still very much in learning mode, and so this conference has been very beneficial for that. Uh, as I said, we distribute the vaccines to the 70th poorest countries in the world, which we define currently on a per capita income basis. Our mission is to save lives and protect health, very straightforward. Uh, we're looking to reach 80% of the children in 90% of the districts of those 70 countries, so we have big, whoops, uh, big aims in terms of coverage. Uh, we are also finally a performance-based organization in that we solicit applications from all the countries. The countries themselves design the programs that they have. Uh, they manage them themselves. Uh, they very much take ownership for progress. Uh, we monitor progress very closely as well. And when countries actually are, are falling off, we decide to actually retard money and try to figure out what's going on. So we very much fund against milestones. Uh, so that's, I think, a very important uh, part of what we think makes our program successful thus far. Our business model is pretty straightforward. Uh, the first thing that we try to do is build a very robust funding base. I call it a 360-degree funding base, and that we try to raise money from every different possible source of funders. Um, and we try very hard to make most of that what I call multi-year committed money. Right now, about two-thirds of our balance sheet and future balance sheet is unconditional and committed for long periods of time. We also try very hard not to earmark our money because we need to be able to deploy money where the results are being achieved, but also use that money very much on a bulk purchase basis. Uh, the second important thing about our business model is that we make, as I said, multi-year commitments to the countries. It takes a very long time, three, five longer years, to actually launch successful immunization programs on the ground. And so we like very much to signal to the countries that provided they're making their milestones, that we will, in fact, continue funding. Thirdly, as far as our business model, we like to signal a willingness to the pharma community that we are there to buy vaccines. We'll buy the vaccines that exist now, and we will also buy the vaccines when they are um, available in the future. And so we like very much to act as a pull mechanism towards the vaccine industry. And thus far, if you look at some of our results, we are seeing that there are additional suppliers that have come into the market, as well as, in some cases, prices have begun to come down. So that piece is working. We also make, and this is a new part of our business, we're just starting this, long-term investments in health infrastructure on the ground. Uh, what we're finding increasingly is it's not just a problem of having the vaccine available, we also have to get the vaccine delivered. And so we're now beginning to work with countries to help them rehabilitate their health infrastructures. So all of this, we're hoping, creates, uh, comes together, we hope to create what we call a virtuous circle, which is more funding, uh, will hopefully stabilize and increase demand for these vaccines, which will hopefully signal to suppliers that they, in fact, should come into this market, it's a worthwhile market, uh, and then hopefully prices will come down, and then hopefully that will create a situation where the products are available at much more affordable prices on a sustained basis. Uh, so that's what we try to do. We're, uh, our results thus far, as I said, we're young, but we're, uh, we're happy, I think, thus far with our results. I think we find it encouraging that the business model is working. Uh, we've raised so far a little over $3.5 billion from various funders, principally governments. Uh, we have also raised another $4 billion through this thing I'll talk about in a second called the International Finance Facility for Immunization. That $4 billion is money that will become available to us over 10 years. We've committed about two and a half billion of that, and we'll con we have a very active program of actually making commitments to countries, so that number is steadily increasing. Uh, most importantly, we've prevented about 2.3 million early deaths thus far in a five or six year period, and we're happy with that number, but it's something that's uh, always important to increase. Uh, we've immunized about 28 million people with uh, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, and that's enabled us to raise coverage rates materially in that one, vac that one group of vaccines. We've also immunized about another 140 million people in the other vaccines that we deal with, hepatitis B, uh, haemophilus influenza B, yellow fever, and some others. And that's allowed us to raise uh, coverage rates in a number of countries throughout uh, in those areas. Um, so we're... Uh, so far, so good, but we have, as, as you can imagine, a huge amount of work ahead of us. 
Let me now change gears quickly and tell you very quickly about two of the financing mechanisms we put in place over the last, um, the last bit of time. And they specifically are designed to address uh, some of the challenges that I mentioned earlier. The first one is uh, what I just talked about, which is the International Finance Facility for Immunization. And I was uh, uh, lucky enough to be invited to this conference last year and made a bit of a talk about it to a much smaller group. And I was keeping my fingers crossed that we'd actually get this thing done. And we, in fact, did get it done. We launched our first piece of it last November. Uh, but the program is designed to basically address the lack of committed funding. Uh, the project itself was born as a pilot of Gordon Brown's uh, International Finance Facility, which itself was designed to finance all of the uh, MDGs. Um, due to an awful lot of elbow grease from a lot of people, uh, we've now been able to negotiate 20-year legally binding, so contractual commitments of aid from seven, and it's about to be eight, different donor governments. And that includes the UK, France, Norway, Sweden, Spain, Italy. Uh, we've just signed up South Africa, which is extremely important because of, of the ability to engage middle-income countries in this. And Brazil is also on the way, so we're just extremely excited about that. Uh, we took the package of these promises from these countries, and we've taken them to the bond market and now borrowed against them. And so. Over time, this package of promises will allow us to raise about $4 billion. Um, it's a very important mechanism as far as how it meshes with our program, because we like to be able to make multi-year commitments any time that we need to uh, to countries. So this type of financing mechanism meshes very, very well with what our programmatic uh, challenges are. Uh, so the program itself is extremely powerful. As I said, we issued the first billion dollars this past November. Uh, it was priced uh, very close to where U.S. Treasuries and agencies price. Uh, it's in the sort of sovereign, supranational end of the market. Uh, we got three AAA ratings from all the rating agencies, uh, due uh, very much in part to all the hard work by the World Bank, who is our Treasury manager on this. It was oversubscribed, and we're very, uh, very, very happy as, as our initial uh, launch of it. Uh, of the billion dollars that we've raised, uh, we spent about $840 million already, and those are programs to support uh, efforts in measles, polio, yellow fever, and a number, number of other important areas. So we're already seeing tangible, we're already using the program very tangibly to advance uh, our efforts. Um, so we're very excited about it. Uh, the second program that I want to talk to you about a little bit is called the Advanced Market Commitment Program. Uh, this is something that we're working on right now and are looking to try to get it completed by uh, end of this year, early next year. Um, and I spoke earlier about how long it takes to actually get a product to market and to, to get it to market in a way that ultimately will be affordable. And so what this program does is it specifically tries to address that challenge. If you look at, and there's a number of economists in the room, so I speak cautiously about price curves, but I'll do it anyway. Um, if you look at the price curve of a vaccine uh, without any kind of market intervention, it takes a very long time for that price curve to come down to a level where it is affordable by the 70th poorest countries. And that is at you know, several cents, you know, 20 cents. Um, and if you're looking to try to get new vaccines and new technologies down to that price level, it it's going to take an awfully long time. And the price curve will respond over time to new entrants to the market, to demand, to suppliers, but it's going to take too long. Um, so what this mechanism tries to do is that it tries to accelerate and collapse that price curve. And so the way that it works is that we are actually setting up a contractual mechanism where a group of funders will actually top up the price for a specific period of time, so it's in a sense a subsidizing mechanism. Uh, they will top up the price principally to repay the R&D costs and initial scale-up costs of those vaccine manufacturers that qualify. But in exchange for that, they have to be willing to sell it at very low prices after the initial period expires. And the idea is to, on the one hand, get the price to come down faster, but on the other hand, not do it in a way that disincents the R&D at the front end. Um, so thus far, we've uh, been able to pull together about a billion and a half dollars of, uh, of donor support for this. Uh, it's five governments plus the Gates Foundation. So it's, it's Russia, the UK, Italy, some of the same names as I managed before, as I said before, Norway, Canada, as well as the Gates Foundation. Um, the initial pilot effort of this is going to be oriented towards the pneumococcal disease. Uh, right now, as many of you know, a pneumococcal uh, vaccine exists in this country. It's called Prevnar. It's seven valent. I think it costs about $50 a dose, but I'm not sure, but it's expensive. Um, and what we're trying to do is have this mechanism actually incent the creation and accelerate the creation 
of, pre of pneumococcal um, vaccine that would be uh, both 10 and 13 uh, valent. And those are um, formulations of the vaccine that I think are more appropriate for the, the markets that we operate in. Um, so we think that this, uh, pro this whole program will be successful and really help us to try to, to bring down the prices faster and get the products out there faster. Uh, so let me end there. I wanted to touch on the theme that everyone's, as a last comment, to talk about failures. And I think there's a couple of things um, that I know within Gavi that we think about, and I think we probably need to think about it more. And one is, and I wonder about this a lot, and it's, it's somewhat ironic given that I'm the CFO that I wonder about it, but I wonder if we're too process-oriented, and I'm wondering if there's too many steps along the way that we go through, too many controls, too many reports, too many things like that that get in the way of us actually getting the money out the door faster. And I think that's something at least our organization can think about. Um, the second thing is I, I would encourage all of us to not get too into the weeds of institutional differences between us and try to work together as much as we can across both, you know, sort of organizational boundaries, geographic boundaries, as well as public-private types of boundaries. So let me end there and, and thank you for including me. Thank you, Ellis. This has been a very exciting panel, and we've been totally unfair to the audience on questions. But I am going to take two questions before we break for uh, who's quickest. Okay. Thank you very much. Is this on? Yes. Is this on? Yeah, it's Wilfred Welch, the Quest for Global Healing Initiative. I want to ask Peter a very specific question. I was fascinated by your comment that. Uh, Russia, India, China were outside the norm of how they're uh, providing aid and that there are new mechanisms that you see may evolve over the short, uh, short term. What are those that you are beginning to think about that might, uh, might occur, particularly China? Um, so, or sure, we do? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first, the, on, the, on the positive side, um, as I mentioned, China has become a donor to the, to the Global Fund. I can't remember. It's a small amount of money, but I think once the decision is taken, it will go up. Russia has said that it will reimburse basically what it got from the Global Fund. So that these are new trends. Um, but China is becoming very active, particularly in Africa. It's linked to, um, well, to the, to the race for, um, for resources, for oil and uh, copper and, and just name it. And it, uh, associated with that is uh, made, uh, major investments, particularly uh, infrastructure, but also a little bit in the social sector. And uh, whereas um, Western donors operate um, with a certain code of conduct with, uh, under the uh, OECD DAC, that's, that's uh, the development, uh, uh, what is it, action committee or no, um, in, in Paris. From the, um, the, um, uh, China is totally outside that, doing business uh, in the way that uh, Western donors did business maybe 20 years ago. And uh, I, I think we really have to, um, to bring China in the tent. And I think for, the, um, uh, for this forum that it would be great to make it a, tr a truly global forum, because it's not really global. I mean, sometimes I feel that, you know, we too here, we <laughs> represent the rest of the world. But, um, and bringing in, Chinese, Indian, uh, Russian foundations, entrepreneurs, it's, it's cooking there. But in China itself, there is not much philanthropy yet. India is growing, but China, I don't see it. And if it's there, it's mostly multinational companies. It's not Chinese, Chinese companies. So I think it's a, it's a very exciting area that we should capitalize on and that we should bring these potential newcomers uh, in this group as soon as possible. Thank you. One more question. Yes. My name is Linda Segre. I'm with Google.org. Um, and my question is for you, Lisa. I was very fortunate to get to visit some CFW shops in Embu and Kibera. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could describe for me what are the two or three barriers that you would need to overcome in order to spread throughout all of Kenya and perhaps even get to some other countries in Africa? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we currently are at about uh, 64 outlets, um, that is um, six years or so after having uh, developed this. We've seen tremendous growth in terms of the number of uh, clients that we have reached. 
Um, last year, we had 470,000 uh, people that got treatments through the CFW outlets. And our plan is to grow over the next um, three to four years to about 250 outlets because we feel we can actually reach 2 million clients uh, or provide 2 million treatments um, to clients in a year at, at that level of uh, number of outlets. We feel that the model is infinitely scalable. You know, it, it's, a, it's a franchise, it's controlled, it's, it's, a, it's a model that is well known, and especially here in America, where a lot of your new businesses are all coming up in the franchise system. So for us, we have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of hope that we can get that support to scale up. Um, as a small NGO, I believe that uh, what has held us back more than anything is lacking the skills, you know, that uh, uh, Alice Albright has got in terms of funneling, you know, this amount of funding that is needed in order to support yeah, this kind of effort to grow to that. And the other thing, as we have had the panelists talking about, is the need to then get governments to invest in this, in this type of a model, because it's a great distribution model. You can use it for the vaccines that, you know, we're talking about, which you can use it for the HIV AIDS, for, um, not only the drugs, but also the information. We use it for malaria, you know, to get the information out there. So once you've got a distribution network that has been set up, then you can and funnel all your healthcare interventions through this system that is consistent quality, that has the controls in it, and that provides a business, you know, incentive uh, for sustainability. What a great last question and great last answer. Uh, thank you. And as, as I... As I thank the panel, uh, let me elicit the memory of Kurt Vonnegut, who died this week. And in his final book, A Man Without a Country, he talks about his uncle Alex, who would, at the most uh, interesting moments, stop and say, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. If this panel wasn't nice, I don't know what is. <laughs> you, 